Spooky action at a distance is something that Einstein and Schrodinger both worried about. Um, less so, less worry from the quantum mystics community. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, this talk will look at the underlying theoretical and experimental situation relating to that. And our speaker will examine the notion of quantum entanglement, which trips off the tongue in everyday conversation all the time. <laughs> and ask whether it's spooky, as it's sometimes cracked up to be. Alan Stairs is a member of the philosophy department at the University of Maryland, where he is the associate chair. His research centers on issues in the foundations of quantum mechanics. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And what I want to do is mainly give a talk that goes over a lot of kind of historical background and so on that will help you see where this issue comes from and uh, a little bit about what uh, physicists might say. Most of that is uh, going to not really touch on the sort of larger issues that uh, people interested in skepticism might have in mind, but they will definitely come up once we've set the stage at the end and we can certainly talk about it in the question period. So, our agenda is going to be this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sketch perhaps the most famous uh, argument bearing on this whole subject in physics, the so-called einstein podolsky rosen argument. And this is an argument that uh, Einstein had a part in developing, which was intended to show that, as, uh, as, as Einstein and others saw, that quantum mechanics was incomplete. So explain what that means. And then we're going to identify a presupposition that this argument makes. And we're going to set forth uh, what in the physics community, in the philosophy of physics community, is a very well-known reply due to the physicist John Bell. And then we will say some things about entanglement, locality, and spooky action, and distance, all these wonderful phrases. So, what I want to do is I want to go back to 1935 when Einstein and Boris Podolsky and Nathan Rosen published this, uh, this famous paper, uh, Can Quantum Mechanics Be Considered Complete? And I'm just going to sketch briefly what they had to say because it sets the stage for the kind of worries and problems that we're interested in here. But the first point is this, the way that people thought about quantum mechanics, and, uh, and in many ways many people still do, is this. If quantum orthodoxy is right, if the usual way of thinking about quantum mechanics is right, then if you've got a quantum system, think whatever you like, an electron, an atom, uh, it doesn't really matter. We normally think of things as having a certain position, they're located somewhere, and they're going at a certain speed, and depending on their mass, that means they have a certain momentum. So that's how we think of ordinary things around us. They are somewhere, and they're moving in a certain way. But if the usual way of thinking about quantum mechanics is right, this sidebar to Heisenberg's uncertainty relations that we won't actually discuss directly here, then, well, especially at the quantum level, that can't be right. It can't be right, the orthodox view said, that something is both well located and moving at a different speed, a definite speed, pardon me, at the same time. We can say more about that later if we like, but that's, that's a very standard way of thinking about things. And what EPR uh, say is they say, well, this orthodoxy can't be right. And they argue that it can't be right by offering a certain kind of common sense principle. And I'm just going to kind of sum up their principle here. So suppose there's this quantum system over there, and I'm doing some measurements here on another quantum system. And suppose that by doing my measurements here, I can make all kinds of predictions about that system over there. Maybe I can predict what would happen if you measured its position. Maybe I can predict what would happen if you measured its momentum. Now what EPR say is that if I can make those predictions, and I can do it without disturbing that system, without interfering with it or interacting with it, they'll, then there's got to be what they call an element of reality that is responsible for the fact that I can predict what would happen if you measure the position or if you measure the momentum. 
put briefly, there must be a position, or there must be a momentum over there. It was not created by what I do, but it's already there. Okay? Now, what they then go on to do is consider a special sort of a state of two form of systems. We won't get into the technical details. All we need to do is understand how the system works. So we've got these two separated systems, we'll just label them one and two, and they're in this special quantum state. When I say special, it's not exotic, it's just a particular <coughs> kind of state. And the way it works is this, if I have one of these systems in my position, in my position, and I measure where it is, then I can predict perfectly what someone over there would find if they wanted to measure exactly where that system was. So I find the position here. I can predict the position over there. But on the other hand, if I wanted to measure the momentum of my system, let's just think for the moment about how fast it's going, well, I could do that, and likewise, I could predict the momentum of that system over there. Now, it turns out that I can't do both of these things. I can't measure both the position and the momentum of the system at the same time. They interfere with one another. But I can pick which one, whichever one I pick, I will be able to predict the corresponding experimental result over there. So what EPR would say is, look, if I want to predict that system's position, I can do it without interfering with it. On the other hand, if I want to predict its momentum, I can do that too. It must really have a position. It must really have a momentum. This seems like a very common sensible uh, way to think. In spite of the fact that no quantum state, the state in quantum mechanics is what you used for making all of your detailed descriptions of the system, no quantum state will tell you both of those things at once. And so Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen say quantum mechanics must be incomplete. There must be some information missing here. Okay, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe the version of this argument that tends to be thought about these days because the experiments are why you do. <coughs> so we're going to introduce a term here. The term is spin, and we don't need to worry about the physics of it in any way except this. Things like electrons can be measured for their spin. It's measured in whatever direction you pick. I can measure spin in this direction, I can measure spin in this direction, in that direction, whatever you like. And if I measure the electron spin in some direction, I'll always find that it's either plus one or minus one. Sometimes put up or down. And that's just a fact about the quantum world, okay? You don't need to worry about why or where that comes from. It's just something about electrons. Now I can pick whatever direction I like. So they've got this directional property spin. And I can pick a direction and I can measure the spin in that direction. But I can't measure in two directions at the same time. In the same way that I can't measure position and momentum at the same time, I can't measure spin in this direction and this direction at the same time, for example. Okay, so now what? Well, we can set up this special state. This is called the singlet state. That's just its name. Don't worry about why. And this is a special state of a pair of electrons. Um, so suppose that our two electrons, one and two, are in this special state called the singlet state. And no matter what direction I pick to measure, it's called D, if I measure the spin in direction D, and someone over there measures the spin in the same direction on their particle, we'll always get opposite results. If I find plus one, they'll find minus one. If I find minus one, they'll find plus one. And it doesn't matter what direction we pick, as long as the directions are parallel. Okay? That's just a fact about the quantum world. That's kind of interesting. You think, gee, I mean, there's obviously some sort of really interesting correlation between these two things. How does that work? So, you know, this is just a coin little picture, but the idea is that I've got these meters set to measure in the same direction, and they show up with opposite results. Okay? Different direction if it was the same. Um, uh, same direction in both cases, I measure the two, uh, I always get off the same result. So that's just a little image, if you like, of what's going on here. Now there is a, a technical note that you don't need to worry about, but it's just this. I have to do this um, 
pair by pair, because after the first measurement, the correlation is broken. This correlation is very fragile. It lasts for one measurement, and then it's broken. But I can take a whole bunch of pairs, all in the singlet state, you know, hundreds of them, and measure, and measure, and measure, and measure, and do it in all kinds of different directions, and notice the sorts of correlations I get. And that's exactly what they do. All right? 